Um, anyway, Nate has certainly given me a, a very nice introduction. I do have a website, which is both a scientific website and a personal website. It has a list of my publications. Um, so if those interest anybody, you can just send me an email. So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, basically four things, climate change with a focus on the southeast. Then I'll talk about uh, our long-term studies of population regulation. Then we'll talk about fitness, ooh, missing D there, fitness-based habitat selection models and a little bit about uh, work we're doing in STEM uh, pedagogy. All right. So. Uh, why do we need long-term studies? This slide should convince you of that need. This is uh, population Grossman in 1973, uh, and you see population Grossman <laughs> 2019 right, right in front of you. So, uh, so what, what has this long-term study shown us? Well, uh, certain things have increased, weight, blood pressure, cholesterol. It's not all bad. My salary is much, much higher. And I own a lot more property than I did then. Other things have decreased, all right? My muscular flexibility has decreased. Free time, my recreational drug use, I probably shouldn't have said that. Uh, and the number of girlfriends, uh, but my wife who's sitting over there and is a nutrition faculty member knows all about that anyway. <laughs> Okay, so uh, certainly for people in this room, uh, I, I don't need to spend a lot of time on, on climate change, but let's talk a few minutes about what is predicted and what has already happened in the Southern Appalachians, which is the focus of, of my research. So what's happened really since 1980, actually, is that mean air temperatures and drought intensity have increased significantly. Uh, annual variability in precipitation has increased significantly. Uh, and uh, a little unpublished study that we did using flow data from the Coweta Hydrologic Station shows that variability in flow has increased as well. So uh, if we look at the period in which the gauges at Coweta have been operating, a uh, 70 plus year period, but we just look at the post-1980 period, we find that eight of the 10 lowest mean annual daily flows have occurred post-1980 and eight of the 10 highest mean annual daily flows. So the system is becoming more and more val uh, variable, uh, especially true for the aquatic portion, which of course as a fisheries biologist, uh, I'm interested in, and the trends at Coweta match the regional trends based on other investigators' work. I have a, a lot of data that I'm going to talk about. Not, not really a lot of data, but a lot of, a lot of points that I want to make. So I'm going to try and, and speak quickly uh, and hopefully be done in 50 minutes. So this just is a little graphic because a picture is worth a thousand years. Uh, the data that I'm going to talk about, at least in the long-term population analysis, uh, mean annual daily flows of those years are in pink. Uh, you can see here we have some of the highest mean annual daily flows and some of the lowest in, in that 20-something year period. In the 20-something year period and out of the 70-year period. Okay, variability. Um, so one of the main research questions that, I've, that I address in my many years here uh, is what are the factors that affect population variation in fishes, in particular stream fishes? So uh, we started out way back in the last century uh, setting up permanent sites uh, in streams on the Coweta Hydrologic Station. Uh, we did that on the Coweta Hydrologic Station because they gauge the watersheds, all that flow data you just saw. Uh, so we don't, you know, we have a lot of physical chemical data available to us that we don't have to collect ourselves. So uh, we started out in spring of 84, we ended up in spring of 2004, we have 21 years of quantitative samples twice a year. For the resident fishes, that represents four to five generation times. Um, so 
we can talk about processes that are important really on a, on a short-term evolutionary scale. We also collected habitat availability data and we have flow data. Here we are in one of our sites. Uh, we block net, electrofish, uh, make quantitative estimates of, of density. Uh, this is, in case you don't know where the Coweta Hydrologic Lab is, it's straight up 441 basically, just over the North Carolina line. Uh, this graphic just shows our study sites and when they were sampled. All right, this is, uh, can everybody see the slides okay? Should I turn the lights off back there or can you see okay? All right. Uh, you know, this is really a horrible place to work, but uh, somebody, somebody has to get out there in summertime when it's 95 degrees and 98% and, uh, humidity here down in the Piedmont and, and uh, undertake the odious task of collecting data in habitats like this. So I'm going to, excuse me, I'm gonna talk about the four dominant species, uh, the mottled sculpin, the long-nosed dace, the mottled sculpin is a species that has the widest natural distribution in the United States of any freshwater fish. All right, the long-nosed dace is a fish that has the widest distribution in the minnow family. Water column, water column, benthic, benthic. All right, so, so we're talking about species, at least with respect to the benthic fishes, that are widely distributed. Okay, so why, besides the funny graphic, I started with uh, why is it important to determine the relative importance of density independent versus density dependent factors? And those are the two classic or, or two endpoints of continua for, for people who study population regulation. And so density independent populations that are uh, controlled by density independent processes are, uh, they display dynamics like this. So let's say this was a fish, it, population builds up, boom, all of a sudden there's a flood, uh, the population crashes, et cetera, et cetera. So these populations, the abundance of these populations uh, is controlled by things that have, have nothing to do with the fish density or the insect density or the bird density, okay? Uh, in contrast, populations that are regulated by density dependent forces are those which display dynamics that are exactly like this sounds. Uh, when density is low, reproduction is high, survivorship is high, uh, fecundity is high, and as it increases and hits perhaps uh, in equilibrium, which all the Warnell students know we abbreviate as K, carrying capacity, those processes, the rates of those processes decline. So uh, re the reproductive rate declines, uh, typically mortality is higher, uh, survivorship is lower, et cetera. And so why is this important? Well, it's, it's important because of what I've written here. The only types of populations that can be managed or exploited on a sustainable basis are those that show density-dependent dynamics. And the reason for that, uh, and, and all harvesting theory is based on that premise. The reason for that is as you remove individuals, you push the population down to a level at which the demographic responses, the rates of those demographic responses increase and the population replaces those individuals that you, that you removed. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, as we're all taught in our first uh, wildlife class, the, the point at which you can maximize exploitation as carrying capacity divided by two. Of course, it's, it's never as simple as that. All right, so uh, with this 20 years, four to five generations uh, of fishes that I've studied, 
uh, what do I do with these data? And, and so essentially, we take these uh, annual estimates of density, annual estimates of growth, et cetera, and we do what's called a model selection analysis, where we build regression models, and then we test the information loss in these various models. Uh, that, that's not really the right way to say it. We, we use these various models and see via the use of the model, let's say a model that's just straight density dependence, how much information in the original data is lost. So it's a, this statistical approach is, is different from uh, an R squared, you know, a frequentist uh, statistical approach, but the great advantage of it is you can have competing models. So you can do multiple hypothesis testing, plus you can have models that include more than one factor. All right, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time uh, on this because it would take the rest of the seminar time. But, but basically, if density independent factors are the dominant controlling factor, we would find that the per capita rate of increase and standard length, which is a surrogate for growth, would be correlated with some density independent parameters, such as flow, mean flow, et cetera, or habitat variation. And, and when we quantify habitat availability, we measure 13 different variables within the reach. Again, I'm not gonna go into it, but if you have any questions, you can always ask later. So if density dependent factors uh, explain variation that is important uh, or explain an important amount of, of variation than the per capita rate of increase and standard length are going to be inversely correlated with density and of course we have models that combine both processes so uh, so what did we find during this 20 plus year period there were two periods of multi-year drought uh, these actually were four years in, in both data sets. Uh, we found that in the drought years, there was a decrease in high flow events, a decrease in mean depth, velocity, and erosional substrata. Erosional substrata are just big, big things, rocks, boulders, uh, cobbles, and, and not. Uh, depositional substrata are silt, uh, sand, etc. cetera. And, and what we can see here is that the patterns are exactly the same. Uh, for both droughts. So I'm going to go through the data for rosy side days, the uh, most abundant water column minnow, and then just give you a summary slide for the other three species. So this is the kind of output. These are all the models we, we tested. Simple density dependence, delayed density dependence, positive density independence, negative density independence, delayed negative, anyway, you don't see any entries down there, so I'm not really gonna go through that, but you can see that we tested kind of every common sense model that was possible. So <clears throat> if, uh, if an entry is pink, it means it explained the greatest amount of, of, well, I keep getting caught in my 40 years of frequentist statistics. It, it had the lowest information loss. So it, it, you could say it had the greatest explanatory power for explaining information that was in the original data set. And you interpret, these are Akai-K coefficients. Uh, you interpret these like an R value, except it can't be negative. So if that value is 1.0, there is no information lost in the original data by use of the model. Uh, conversely, if it's zero, then, then all the information is lost. So th the only real important point here is that uh, density dependence and delayed density dependence uh, really were the only interpretable models and there are criteria for deciding whether a model is interpretable or not, but these were the only interpretable models except for a little bit of positive density independence. I'll show you what caused that in a minute. So for rosy side days, strong evidence that, that the population actually is regulated via density dependent processes, probably intraspecific competition. Okay, so where did that little bit of positive density independence come from? 
so these are the number of juveniles, right? Uh, and this is just time here. For three different sites, you'll notice the, the axis here, the time axis is a little different. Uh, drought year data are these open histograms and non-drought years are the closed histograms. And what you can see here quite clearly is that uh, recruitment of this species is strongly correlated with low flows. So might be low flows, it might be the absence of high flows, not really sure. But, but uh, like, like many species, uh, even though we can say it's mostly density dependence, there is some evidence for a certain segment of the population that density independent processes are, are important as well. Um, so this is to give you an idea of how complex uh, these relationships can be and why our jobs as resource managers are difficult. Okay, and it's because these, these relationships can change. So this is Cottus baradi, that sculpin, uh, the most widely distributed fish or natural distribution in North America. Here we have flow again. Uh, here we have young of the year density, the number of young that are recruiting. This is actually two points. So what you can see here is depending on whether it's a drought or whether it's a high flow year, the relationship between flow uh, and recruitment of young changes completely. So in high flow years or average flow years, there's a negative relationship, excuse me, and in drought years, there's a positive relationship. And that, uh, that tells us two things. Number one, our job as resource managers is difficult. Uh, because these relationships are contingent, they're contingent on what the conditions are in the year that you're studying. Uh, well, actually, that's both the reasons, okay? The second reason is, again, demonstrating the need for long-term data, because if I had just studied these years, I would have come up with a relationship between flow and recruitment that, that for the species, was inaccurate. All right. So to summarize, uh, for all four species, we had 16 possible comparisons or 16 analyses uh, for the per capita rate of increase, density dependent, at least one density dependent model was, was interpretable in every one of those analyses. Uh, density independence played a lesser role uh, which in some respects is good because this says that we don't want to exploit these species necessarily, although those of you with sharp eyes saw a rainbow trout with a fly in the corner of its mouth. But, uh, but we could, right? Because they're, they're really regulated by density dependent processes, we could remove a small number and the population would bounce back. Uh, for growth, the data are less clear, but half the time density dependence shows up and only rarely does density independence show up. So these fishes, at least these dominant ones in, in my site, uh, are, are strongly affected by density dependence. And so I used the case of, of exploitation, but of course I started out talking about climate change, right? And, and so exploitation, so density dependence is important for any perturbation, right? Be it climate change or be it exploitation. Anything that could reduce population size, if the population is, is not strongly affected by density dependence, then a perturbation can drive it to extinction. And, and you'll see that that's exactly what my next slide shows, that that what we have to worry about in the southeast, at least with respect to, to animals and, and to fishes, but this applies to, to birds just as well, um, if there's an effect of density independent factors, well, with our fishes, uh, with reduced, with high flows, we have reduced young of the year abundance, with low flows, we have increased. Uh, decreased density dependence or decreased density dependent intraspecific competition, uh, more compensatory responses. Uh, with climate change, remember that early slide I showed you is that variability is increasing. 
And it's possible that this variability in flow is going to tip these species into a domain in which density independence all of a sudden becomes way more important than density dependence and that could lead to decreased population compensation. We use that term compensation uh, to represent the, 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 how those demographic rates change, right? So compensatory responses are, are uh, high. They're, they're where the population gets knocked down, the reproductive rate increases very quickly and, and uh, of high magnitude. So uh, if we have decreased compensation, and increased variability, we're going to have an increased probability of extinction for, for the aquatic fauna. So that is not good news. And another justification for continuing to study uh, so that we can hopefully just before this tipping point uh, might be reached, we, you know, we could employ some management means to, to try and counter the effects of climate change. Okay, so I hope that's clear to everybody and now I'll, I'll move into the second portion of my talk which is uh, another major focus of, of our lab and that is developing uh, fitness-based models for microhabitat selection for fishes and, and microhabitat is just the area around a fish. So if it's the fish sitting here, it's the velocity at which it sits, it's the depth, it's the substratum composition, etc. Uh, one thing to note is that the most widely used habitat models to predict fish abundance do not include fitness at all. They are based solely on the physical habitat and that that is a real flaw. So this is an attempt to build a model that, that not only has biology in it, but is based on uh, factors which directly affect an individual's fitness. So uh, I, my group has been working on this for, you know, probably since before some of you were alive. Uh, and just to give you a, a simple insight into, into what we're talking about with one of these net energy gain models. Here's, so these drift feeding fishes are fishes that sit in the water column. Uh, an insect floats by and boom, they nail it. All right, so uh, how important are drift feeding fishes? Uh, of the freshwater fish fauna in the southeastern United States, I would say probably half are drift feeders. They're up there in the water column. Worldwide, at least in the temperate zone, that's probably a pretty accurate estimate as well. So this is, this is not a trivial group of fishes, okay? Uh, almost all uh, sport fish are drift feeders to a greater or lesser degree, all the salmonids for sure. Okay, so an important point here because I'm not going to talk about the impact of predators uh, is that at Coweta, uh, predators are unimportant. Uh, I mean we have quantified that over again generations uh, of fishes displaying their microhabitat use. So uh, predators aren't causing, they aren't affecting microhabitat choice. So this is just a simple cost-benefit model that actually biologists stole from economics, microeconomics, many years ago. Um, so typically for a fish, a stream fish, that's up in the water column, as velocity increases, cost increases, and, and then it, it starts to increase exponentially, okay? Uh, benefit increases, increases, and that starts to level off. It actually, if we're just sampling, it, it goes like that. But what happens is, at a certain velocity, the fish can't even, even though the bugs are increasing, the fish no longer have the physical capability of capturing them. So, so this reaches an asymptote, uh, the maximum between these two lines is the point at which an individual fish has the maximum amount of free energy, right, to avoid predators, to avoid diseases, to uh, impress the ladies if you're, if you're a male, okay? Um, so that should be the optimal velocity that we should find these fishes holding at. Um, so, 
I spent, uh, not, not I, my unfortunate students, spent years parameterizing these two curves. And what we found out was that it's, it's really, well, I'll just jump to this slide, it's really very difficult to parameterize the cost curve. And what you end up are getting curves that have variance estimates that are like that. And so when you actually plug them to derive the <laughs> optimal velocity, you plug them in, what you end up finding is that the variance added uh, actually yields a less accurate prediction of where the optimum velocity is. So we thought, besides the fact that it takes years to get these data, um, maybe we could just look at the benefit portion of the curve, all right? Uh, we, could, we could derive some sort of reduced model that, that is based on empirical data, uh, and then we could derive an optimal holding velocity for these fishes and then go out in the field and test that. And so this involves math and substitutions and all sorts of things. Uh, but basically what we've done is, is we've gotten to a point where we can take a velocity versus prey capture success curve uh, and, and doing some substitutions and incorporating some assumptions. We can predict the optimal velocity for these fishes, the, the velocity at which these fish, fishes should hold in the natural environment. Okay, so... Uh, We'll see how technically challenged I am. So this is going to show an Arctic grayling. Uh, it's going to show you how these data are obtained. And these are data from Brian Bozeman, who's sitting back there uh, from his master's thesis, which will, part of his master's thesis, which will be published. Maybe I should, did it get up? Brian, did it, did it grab a prey yet or no? I thought I grabbed one right in the beginning. Right, so this fish is going to grab two prey. So these are our experiments. We have a tank, we put the fish at the back, and we know what the velocity is. We control velocity. That grayling shipped all the way from Alaska. Uh, th that grayling, I don't know, maybe about 14 centimeters. Uh, and so we sequentially increase velocities and uh, present nine prey at a given velocity and record how many prey the, the fish gets. So just to give you a mental picture of, of what these experiments look like. And so this is that curve parameterized for, for grayling. Uh, 40 fish is tested, prey capture versus velocity. Okay. So that's how we get the data. So uh, we started out on this track really 20 years ago. Um, these are the results for those for four the four most common water column fishes. Uh, we did experiments with them, and then we take solving that equation and everything. We take that predicted holding velocity. Uh, we go out in the field and with a mask and snorkel. Uh, and we measure the holding velocity of these fishes in the field. Uh, and we calculate a mean and a 95% confidence interval. Uh, if the predicted optimal velocity falls within that, then we say the model successfully predicted where these fishes are, okay? Uh, and you can see these are data from July 1996 uh, in a paper 20, almost 20 years old. The model did really well. Uh, and you can see that, that here's the mean velocity. So these, these fishes are selecting microhabitat uh, because they're not, they're not around the mean. And, and you can see here the variation in water column velocity that's available to them. So they could occur at 128 centimeters per second or they could occur at zero centimeters per second, all right? So uh, that was a graph from, from one month that I showed you. Uh, this again is a summary slide for these four fishes. Uh, the number of successful predictions versus the number of cases. Model works really well for rosy side days. Uh, these cases involve uh, six different seasonal trials, 
in three different sites in two different years. We, we did this a bunch of times, right, to test the generality. We wouldn't want to, I mean, my whole career has been built on showing that environmental variation is important. So I wouldn't want to go out in one year and, and do this and then make a, some evolutionarily relevant prediction. So, uh, you know, the model works, works pretty damn well, actually, um, but not perfectly. And so further testing is, is warranted for sure. So uh, further testing, uh, how far could we go to test this? Uh, well, we went up to Alaska. Why did we go to Alaska? Because they gave me money to do it. That's <laughs> the key to all re successful research now, right? Um, but obviously, that's a, that would be a robust test, too. Uh, so here are just a couple views of, uh, of the rivers we worked in. Again, a god-awful place to work. Uh, in this river, a grizzly took down a female moose about 100 yards below our main study site. So um, there were some tense moments. We didn't actually see that. but. Uh, we, we saw the remains. Uh, so that's the Richardson Clearwater River. This is a second stream we worked in right by Denali <laughs> National Park, uh, Panguini Creek. And so we looked at three species, juvenile Chinook salmon in the Chena River, uh, grayling, you saw a picture of a grayling in our experimental apparatus. Uh, so our predicted holding velocity based on Brian's work. The optimal velocity was 37 centimeters per second. Uh, in the Richardson Clearwater, th actually they were, the mean that these grayling occupied was right on what the prediction was. And there was a fairly small uh, confidence interval around that mean as well. And, and you know, this is a hell of a big Alaskan river. So there, I, we didn't actually calculate habitat availability, but there's a lot of velocity variation in there. Uh, but what happened in Paguini Creek, where they're also, where, where grayling are seasonal migrants, uh, in that case, the mean uh, velocity, holding velocity occupied was 24 centimeters per second. It's quite different. And the confidence interval was much smaller. Not really sure why the model failed in Panguini. It's a much different habitat. There's also a really aggressive resident fish there. Maybe predators are important. We saw evidence of both grizzly and, uh, and wolves, uh, although I don't really think of them as, as eating a lot. I mean, they eat salmon, right? They don't, they don't eat little, little grayling. What about Dolly Varden? These, uh, this is the second portion of Brian's work as well. Uh, so the prediction was 24 centimeters per second. Uh, 27 was the mean, 24.9 to 29.3 centimeters per second. So uh, to use the scientific terminology, uh, we use PDC. Does anybody know what PDC stands for? Pretty damn close, <laughs> all right? Uh, so anyway, it, it, the failure was just by 0 0.9 centimeters per second. It's actually within measurement error. So, so this portion of Brian's thesis was just accepted and it had to go through multiple reviews and, and uh, it accounts for why I, why I put that in there because even though our prediction was within measurement error and uh, you know our, our <laughs> we're off by uh, such a small amount that referees would not allow us to say that the, that the model was successful. What about Chinook? These are small Chinook and the Chena River uh, and, and these guys are way off. Now so the size range of the grayling was what nine to sixteen centimeters, Brian, yeah. in length, and the dollies were a little, a little smaller. Okay, um, these juvenile chinook are are this big. Okay, um, so we predicted thirty five centimeters per second. Uh, they the uh, the observed holding velocity was twelve centimeters per second. So we were we were SOL on this one. Uh, and it's unclear, it's unclear why. Now, of course, 
<coughs> we have we don't have information on how important predation is in these systems and certainly little fish like this are far more subject to predation than than those bigger species that we that we worked in so what can we say in, in terms of summarizing these uh, these efforts uh, for Coweta, you know, mostly successful, probably about 90% of the time. Grayling, uh, successful in one habitat, but not in another. Uh, in this habitat, there are no, grayling is the only species that's there, really. So, whereas in Panguini, those aggressive Dolly Varden trout are, are there as well. Uh, Chinook, again, a failure. Dolly, pretty close. For all three species that we looked at, the Alaskan species dominance had a, a big effect. And, and uh, that might have come to your mind when I was talking about this. Well, how, how, does, uh, how do intraspecific relationships affect this because we're treating every individual the same? So, you know, maybe dominance, I mean, dominance definitely has an impact on prey capture success. Um, <clears throat> so one thing I would like to do, the next step obviously would be to link these results to a hydraulic model that could predict the, the abundance of optimal holding velocities in a reach of river and then go out and, and survey the river and see if, how those two predictions line up. Okay, so <clears throat> to summarize the biology here, uh, as climate change increases, there's the possibility that density dependence within these populations or the importance of it uh, may decrease, which will lead to destabilization, uh, something we really need to be concerned about. Uh, certainly the, the uh, Southeast is the center of aquatic biodiversity in North America. I say North America, it's probably more correct to say the United States and Canada. Um, and these responses, the biological responses to climate change are, are likely going to be uh, complex. I've already talked about how this will uh, decrease our ability to, to manage these species and preserve them. Um, and we're still working on our, our fitness-based microhabitat selection model. All right, so the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, is, are some things that, that, uh, uh, that I've done over the last few years in STEM education. Uh, prior to last year, my teaching was mostly non-Warnell students. Uh, first and second year students who took my natural history of Georgia class uh, and, and I've also taught some FYO classes. The students that are attracted to these classes typically are not science students so it caused me to kind of uh, uh, get on my game teaching wise and, and see what sorts of exercises that I could use to keep them involved in the, in the class. And, and so uh, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on STEM pedagogy today. Uh, the old timers in the audience, including myself, were, were brought up using a passive learning model. And that's what we're doing right now. So I'm, I'm up here talking. And aside from the few people that have dozed off already, uh, you're absorbing what this knowledge that I present to you. Um, all right, so, so we know from, from decades of educational research that, that that's kind of down here on this, what's called Bloom's taxonomy of, of knowledge. And so what this pyramid shows is increasing levels of tasks that link to increasing retention and learning. So at the top, it's creating, all right? Uh, so I tried to develop some fun exercises uh, for my classes that, that kind of put them up on this end of the, of the pyramid. Uh, that end is, uh, techniques that do this are typically called active learning. So they involve student created uh, products. 
And okay, so uh, so I did. I started out with this uh, when I started playing the ukulele. I did uh, I did a fellowship in New Zealand, uh, and although I had my 14 year old daughter with me, I thought I'm going to have a lot of free time. Uh, I've always liked to sing, so but I, I have short, fat fingers which are not suited to guitar. So I thought, well, maybe I could learn the ukulele. So I took a ukulele with me to, uh, to New Zealand, and then I thought, uh, well, maybe I could write some songs that I can use to convey biological knowledge and better engage these, these non-science students. So the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, is is my attempt to develop this multimodal learning uh, form of learning uh, where you use your eyes, your ears, and your voice. Uh, and then I'll talk about the two active learning exercises we now do in all my classes, including 8200, if you're going to take 8200 next semester from me. Um, so. I started out writing songs and recording songs uh, on ecological concepts, on species, and on habitats. Uh, and I published a little paper on that. And here's the YouTube channel that all those songs are on. And now I'm just going to show you a few, some excerpts. So, so I use these in my lecture, but you know, this obviously is teaching them the Linnaean hierarchy. So I use them whenever I lecture on a, on a relevant topic. Now old man Linnaeus, he had a good plan. Great structure from chaos, an arrangement that spans. I'm gonna uh, skip over the last song, and so uh, that resulted in a, in a CD, which I have copies of. Uh, we and Fisheries have had some problems with side businesses in the last uh, six months or so, so uh, you can talk to me after <laughs> after the uh, seminar if you're interested in getting a copy. So. Um, you know, being kind of a dilettante education researcher, I, I talked to people in the ed school, and uh, one of them said, well, you should have the students do this. And I thought, oh, you know, impossible. There's no way the students could do this. And, and then I started thinking, you know, you know, you're not so smart. A student could do it, too. So, uh, so what I have students do that's analogous 
is they do a karaoke video project in class. And depending on the class, it can be a group or an individual project. They can do it uh, on a species, a habitat, a class concept. The students have to find the video and the music, but they have to write. Uh, and, and they don't, some people have some, some people don't like to sing. So they don't have to sing the lyrics. They can sing them, they can rap them, or they can just speak them. And it's graded on the amount of information and sci which scientific accuracy. Uh, and, and so uh, I published a paper last year on student perceptions of this exercise. These were just the courses that was based on. And uh, here you can, you can see some of these videos. So the sound quality on these on these varies. Uh, this is cane, the cane toad, which is invasive everywhere. So this is the Appalachian Mountains. All right, so you can see that the students really get into this, and it's, there's some pretty, pretty impressive work that, that I see. Um, all right, so I evaluated this, and really I'm only talking about student perceptions. It's very difficult to evaluate the actual learning that goes on. Um, so I, I uh, asked the students to fill out a, a uh, Likert scale questionnaire. Likert scales are just, you know, strongly agree, moderately agree, neutral, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, the blue, the, the uh, values in blue are, are the high value. Uh, and above here is that there was a positive response. Uh, down here there was a negative response. I, I reversed some questions. So in some cases the negative side actually is the positive response. All you have to look at here is the pattern, and, and the students really like this. And if you look at research on student perceptions towards assignments, uh, not to toot my own horn, but you rarely get values like this. You know, you, like a value like 60% positive response is earth shaking. But, but my, my students really like this. Um, okay, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about uh, is a different active learning uh, assignment where the students 
actually do behavioral research using what are now called open educational resources. An open educational resource uh, typically is just a video. So what I do is I've made a bunch of videos, birds at my bird feeders, uh, fishes underwater, and we let the students pick the video that they want to work on and then they have to do a little research project about it. Typically uh, characterizing behaviors uh, or looking at, in the bird feeder, looking at whether there are some species that always arrive first, uh, which species fight, which species will, uh, will tolerate each other. Uh, and, and so it's the same kind of lic liquor question. I should, I should mention we also did triangulation interviews for both of these projects. Uh, and a triangulation interview is the purpose is just to get student perception. So, you know, we just ask open ended questions and then record what the students say. So it's like, what was your favorite part? Or what didn't you like? Or how would you change it? And, those triangulation interview results were concordant with these results here. Uh, again, uh, you know, aside from the negative, uh, the negative uh, questions that, that pretty much the students really like this, although not as strongly as the karaoke uh, video exercise. A lot of students, especially non-science students, uh, I don't know, they just don't have a mindset for doing this kind of research and it's, and it's very threatening. And uh, so, I mean, I give them a list of, of potential behaviors they might see. I mean, I try to help them as much as possible, but sometimes uh, the students need a lot of help. And I don't know, maybe I'm just, you know, after 38 years I expect everybody to love what I do. Uh, my wife tells me that's not true. <laughs> okay, so this is my uh, last slide here. Be, be sure to get your flu shots in, uh, in, in this season. And uh, thanks again 